message to that and a cancel message to the other two. Isn't that simple? That's very simple. The lift problem is in a book on theorem proving where the algorithms are completely impossible to understand when it's done in a sequential program without processes. You turn that into a sequential language with, state, with a state machine, it becomes completely impossible to understand. Okay. So if you're modeling real world things and you do it by identifying the processes, identifying the message channels and just writing it down, the program will write itself. If I want to write a program that models this room, you just say, well, what is the appropriate modeling level? I want to model every person. So how many people are there? 80 people in this room? 60 people? We make 60 parallel processes. <coughs> I'm a broadcast processor. You're all listening, I hope. <laughs> Fewer sort of chatting like this. So we, we, just, we just, just make that, and the program writes itself. It's very, very, very simple. One of the biggest faults I see when I look at systems is a bad concurrency model. You know, if, if you had three concurrent things in reality, and you tried to model it using two processes, you'd be totally screwed up. So languages have to actually describe concurrency. So what's an Erlang web server look like that's handling 10,000 users? It's 10,000 little web servers, each handling one user. That's how they look. We spawn a complete web server for everybody. It's not one web server with 10,000 users. It's 10,000 web servers with one, with one user each. That's what an Erlang web server looks like. Which is why when it crashes, only one user suffers, not 10,000. So if Apache crashes, everybody suffers. If an Erlang web server crashes, the process handling the session that user suffers, nobody else suffers. And people haven't understood that. I was at a conference in Germany, and uh, somebody hadn't understood that. And, and so they said, well, we have a pearl of web server. So Germany talk about that. We have a pearl of web server. It can do 10,000 users. And I said, what happens? Well, I didn't know. I said, <laughs> <laughs> what happens if, if, if there's a software error that crashes the server? Does one user crash, or do you lose 10,000? He said, oh, 10,000. <laughs> so that's the difference. You see, Alec like does try to actually make things to be independent. So, how do we do this stuff together? Uh, just sending a vowel for things is a bit tricky because we don't know what's going to be sent. And they after all do have to do something. So this is where the notion of contracts come. And contracts are all about the road. Yeah. So here's my little contract checker again, which I would like to see stuck between everything. And uh, yeah, I just made some stuff for that. Here's a little encoding, which is somewhat prettier than XML. That's XML, and that's Joe's encoding. Which is good. This is actually a bytecode machine, which when you execute it, will reconstruct the term. And there's a type system that describes the terms. And there's a contract, oh yes, here's a little contract that, in terms of the types, and the state machine tells you how the thing works. So uh, this is actually a file server thing. Uh, here are some types. Ah! And these are just sort of abstracted types. So these represent like XML, XML terms or whatever you want to type this. And this represents a state machine that tells you what you can do. So. Uh, you can list, you can do an LS and you get files, and files is just a list of these things, and you can do a get file and get a file and get back. So that's a formal contract. You put it in, and you can check that all the data structures going backwards and forwards are correct. And that's what I'm actually missing from software today. Uh, it's the notion of stateful contracts. Uh, it actually reflected in programming languages. Um, if you look at C, for example, <coughs> if you look at the C file API, it will say that if you open a file, you, 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 you get returned a file handle. That's something you can use to talk to the file with. And if you read a file, you give it as an argument the file handle, and you get that data. And if you close it, you give it the file handle, and it closes the file. Nowhere, amazingly, in all this documentation, does it say that if you close the file, you can't read it anymore. OK? Well, we know that. And that, in that case, it's rather simple. You know, you can't, if, if you've closed it, this file handle is stale. You can't use it again. But that is just like common sense. It's, a meaning, it's appealing to our common sense. But if that API is very complicated, 
We cannot see from the type signatures the order in which we should do things. We can't tell from the Haskell type signatures the order, the allowed order of doing things. It just doesn't tell you. So type systems are woefully inadequate for describing APIs. So you actually need type signatures that describe the protocol. So people who want to do research into, into uh, programming languages should actually look at protocols and how you describe them in terms of type systems. That would be very valuable. Phil Wadler said to me, would I like to join this working group to design yet another programming language? I said, no, 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 the world doesn't need another programming language. You see, if you look at this, there are like 10 million programming languages that run inside black boxes. You can program in Perl and Python and Ruby and God knows what, C, C Sharp, C++. But how many programming languages are there that describe what is going on in between the things? There's only about two or three of them. There's a web service... Uh, the web coordination language, the web service description language. Very few, actually. Can't really think of them. You know, about half a dozen. That's where you should be looking. So if you want to do research projects in the future, look at how you glue things together and how you describe the glue. Because we got that completely wrong. Uh, and then we've got components that are isolated, and that talk to each other using the alphabet of these contracts. So we can wrap up legacy code, we can wrap up things, we can put... Uh, I, I was suggesting actually that we get legacy code like a media player, we put our UBF is my universal binary format, which things can talk to, which is supported with the type system, and you put a contract in, and that tells you what it does, and then you can use this media player as a complex bit of software. So I'd very much like to see the integration of components based on the protocols. Um, I actually, I mean, this machine, I have got Garrett and Personal Orchestra on it. It emulates an orchestra. Beautiful instruments, you know, the sound's absolutely wonderful. I can't use it otherwise. I've got to buy a MIDI keyboard and connect in. And it can only be used in the way they intended you to use it. If you look at the Apple Sound API, playing synthesizers of it is the most goddamn awful thing that has been designed in the entire universe. Why do I not say piano, bang, play note, and it plays a piano note? Why don't I have a UDP port that I send a decoded message to? The way we connect things together has been made artificially difficult by a faulty view of concurrency. It's particularly important when we get to multi-cores. When you have multi-cores, writing sequential programs that's talking to each other is really bad news because you can't split them onto all the cores. In 2019, when we have a million, a million cores per chip, in about 2019, you know, we'll have a hell of a problem if we write a sequential program on them. The lock might, you know, the global lock you use, because you don't know how to lock your stuff, will stop all million cores at the same time. That's not good news. You know, we're moving away from that world. Actually, we just need to isolate all the components and just send messages backwards and forwards. If you write software like that, you'll find it's very composable. Okay. Ah, I'll sort of wind up here a bit. Yeah, well, we know it works well. It scales to large systems. We've built some very large systems with millions of lines of code. Uh, copying all the data structures all the time, we thought might be a problem. But a lot of people said it would be a problem. Robert Deering and I always used to say, we always used to think, one day we'll have to do sharing. But we won't do it yet, because nobody's complained yet. But when they complain, we'll put sharing in, we said. And then they would come and say, well, it's not fast enough. And then we'd just show them how to rewrite it a bit so it was fast enough. And uh, they've stopped asking for sharing anymore. In fact, they'd, ask, they'd want the opposite. They want unsharing, because when the multiports came, they want unshared stuff, not share it. It goes faster. Uh, Multicore stuff is great, actually. Um, I, I can't, I mean, I can't sort of leave all these multicore conferences that go and how to make stuff go far. Airline programs should go like, if you're lucky, if your program is parallel, because you can write purely sequential code in Airline if you want to. But if you've written it with sort of a large number of processes which don't hold. No, they, 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 it's up nicely. They don't have any sequential bottlenecks. You drop it onto a multi-core, it should go about... We aim at 75% per CPU faster, which means if we run on 
four cores, we want to go three times faster, sort of out of the box, if you're lucky. If you run on ten cores, 24 cores, it will run 18 times faster. Um, we have this surreal conversation at work. Um, like, I was at a meeting two weeks ago, we were running on a 64 Tylera processor. We were taking some, just a standard telecoms application that we were experimenting with. It only went 40 times faster, by, with no change to the software, when we dropped it onto 64 cores. And all the boss said, oh, dear. So, so I said, hang on, look, are you pleased that it's going 40 